Packed class today with practice midterms. Yay. Yeah. Uh, yay. Yeah. Midterm on Friday. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Barely works. This is messing with me. Okay. Uh, so the uh, homework for solutions are posted on Blackboard under content, just like everything else. Uh, so you can go there to check out questions on homework four. Uh, any questions before we start today? Let's just roll through it. Do this practice midterm and answer any questions along the way. Questions? Okay. Very important thing on any exam. I, I must have said this before. Right? Oh, thank you. Thanks. Did you steal these? No. Oh, cool. I guess I shouldn't ask that question because I don't actually want to know the answer. <laughs> Somebody tell me how many possible combinations I can put this in wrong. I think it's four. I think it's just four. <laughs> Three. I did every single wrong way. Okay. Yay. Awesome battery. Thank you. This is a good one. I'll put this in All right. Let's rock and roll. Okay. Very first thing you should do on any exam. Put in your name. I literally have a student in my grad class who did not put their name or ASU ID on their midterm. I'm considering it. Or I'm considering lording it over their head for a little bit. Because how do I know it's actually their midterm? Like, I have literally no way. Of course, they're the only student who came forward that said that they didn't get a grade on their midterm. But still, how do I know it's them? Do I do like a handwriting test? Could be yeah. hands cheating. So if someone would take your exam, you get the name. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would be super shady. But that would be like calling more attention to yourself. So it would be self defeating, I think. Okay. Let's. Let's not talk about this. Okay. So we have problem one. We have a function definition here. So we have a function f that takes in four parameters, b, c, d, and e. And the program looks like this. So if d of e, right, then we do 3.14. What's going to be the type of this, 3.14? Real. Yeah. I'd probably also take double uh, if you did that, but it should be real. Right, real plus e bracket b called with 10 e else c d. Right, so what is this doing? It's it's calling a function. When what does this function return? A function. A function, right? That we can see here based on the usage exactly. <laughs> and inside that function is being called e zero. So. We are just going to apply our fun little rules that we've been doing uh, just to solve this problem, right? So I see a function definition. I know, okay, the type of f is going to be uh, a function that takes in t1, takes in a t2, takes in a t3, and takes in a t4, right? One, two, three, four, and returns a t5, right? I also know that this node here, the type of this node is a t5. And from what I've been doing here, I know that B, currently, I know it's of type T1. I know C is of type T2. I know D is of type T3. And I know E is of type T4. Right? This is what I got so far. So it's just looking just at this top node, right? And so some of you, uh, part of the way you can get in trouble with this is if you bring your own preconceptions about what should or should not happen. Right, you start looking at this, and you start saying, well, T5, but then there's a call here, and then there's this other thing, but this is that bracket. Just take it one step at a time, one node, one layer at a time. Like, if it helps, literally, you can block out with your hand, which I can't virtually do here. Oh, maybe I can simulate like this, right? So you can just consider just this function, this very first layer of this tree, right? That's the only thing that matters right now. That's the only thing I've written down. Then we go to the if statement. So we know that an if statement, the left branch, this means this must be a bool, right? And then we know the true branch and the false branch must both return the same thing. What is the same thing that they're going to return? T5. The T5, yeah. So we know that they have to return a T5, which is also the return value of the function f. All right, let's take the Boolean. 
So the Boolean is a call, right? So we're calling function D and we're applying E, right? Or we're, sorry, we're passing it as the first parameter to D, E, and the return values are whatever the return value this no, of this call node is. So then what does this mean about D and E? What do I know here about these two nodes? Yeah, D must be a function that takes in a T4, a type E, and returns a Boolean, right? So I have, basically I have the type equation that D, which is a T3, right, is a function that takes in a T4 and returns a Boolean. So I need to make sure that for all the types that I'm keeping track of that this is true. So I'm going to actually remove T3, so I have no more T3s, and I'm going to say D is a T4 goes to Boolean. Right? So now I've completely gotten rid of T3. There are no T3s in my program anymore. Okay, done with this node. Then we'll go down this tree. So let's do the plus here. What does the plus operator mean? The It means that both sides of it are, well, I mean, it means that the plus left side and right side are all the same type. The left side is the same type, the right side is the same type, and also the return of plus, right? The plus itself is the same type. So these are all T5, right? And then I go visit this node and I say, oh, T5 is actually a real, right? So now I have a constraint that T5 must be the same thing as a real. So now I can replace everywhere I have T5, I'm going to replace it with the reals, right? Because now real is more specific than T5. T5 could be any type, but we know it has to be a real. So let's get rid of that kind of here. Um, we'll get rid of it on the next node. Actually, no, we'll get rid of it here. And the important one is that this T5, right, becomes now a real. Oh, I guess I did do something bad, right? I actually started do, solving this problem without ever reading what this question was asking me to do, right? So maybe it would just ask me what's the type of 3.14, <laughs> right? So it's asking for the types of B, C, D, E, and the type that F returns, right? So that's good. Okay. Let's go to this string. So here we have a real, right? We have an array access operator. So what does this tell me about its children? Right side returns an int. Right side must be an int. And the left side? Array of reals. Array of reals, yeah. Right, so E I know must be an array of reals, which means T4 is now an array of reals. Right, which means this actually D is now, I actually know more about D, right? D is not a function that takes in anything. It's a function that specifically takes in an array of reals. Right, and returns a Boolean. Right, so got that one. Now here we go to another function call. So here we're calling the function D. And we're having the parameters, uh, the first parameter is 10, the second parameter is E, right? And we know that it must return an int, right? So from this, I know the type of B must be an int, right, this first parameter, uh, E, which is an array of reals, right? And all of that returns an int, right? So B was a T1, if I'd replace all T1s in there with this, tree, this is the only part of the subtree that, that is left. So here we have a call function, or we have a call, right? So we're calling some function, and we know that whatever, so let's erase that, right? We know that whatever this function returns is a real, 
So we don't know what this left note is. Let's, we actually didn't number the notes. Let's number this one. And we'll number this two. So we'll say that, or we try to figure this out. We'll do that two, right? We don't know what two is yet. We need some new types. Let's say T six. Six, I think we're at six, yeah. T six. And so we know that one, right? We know that the type of one is a function that takes in a T six and returns a real. So now here, so which one node do you want to visit first, one or two? This is a choose your own adventure. Two, you should, we should, two? Do, we should do two first because two the one has, one's has two one as a parameter. Two is a parameter. So maybe going down one will tell us what that parameter is. Well, maybe, maybe not, but uh, anyways, yeah. It honestly doesn't matter, right? We can do either one. Okay, we go down two. We know that this is a T6. We said this is type T6. And we say it's an array access operator, right? Which means that whatever the right side is must be an int. Is it? Yes. yes. It's a zero. And the left side we know is what? An array of real. An array of T6s. T6s, right? Exactly. This just says this must be an array of T6, right? We also have the constraint that this array of T6 must be the same as E. So this means that T6 must be a real for these to be the same, <coughs> right? So I know now that T6 is now a real. Then here, in the, so now I have to go back to this, the last thing I've got to do, right? Here I see a call function, so our call, so I'm calling the function C. And I'm passing it the parameter D. Array of reals. Right? So D is a function that takes in an array of reals and returns a Boolean. Right? So we just think, okay, so C, actually don't have any type for C, it's just a T2 at this point. So C, right, I know it's got to be a function because it's using a call here. I know it takes in a D2, or sorry, a type of D. Type of D is array of a uh, function that's an array of reals that returns a boolean. So this would be array of real returns a boolean. Cool. Right. This is the first parameter to function C. And then what does C return? A real. A real. The return, say the return value is used as a call to a function, right? So you can't, if you return to real, you'd be trying to call a real as a function and you have a type. It returns one. It returns one, which is a real, a function that takes in a real and returns a real. So this whole thing <coughs> returns <coughs> real, which returns real, right? You kind of want to go, maybe add another parentheses around that. Right, so it's a function that takes in a function and returns a function. This is lambda calculus practice. This is all lambda calculus does. So now I've gone through it and I can fill in all the types, right? So I know B is a function that takes in an int, it takes in an array of reals, and it returns an int. Actually, I'm not going to fill this out because I think it should be clear. We've done everything we need to do. So this is the type of C. This is the type of B, this is the type of D, this is the type of E, and the type that F returns, we know F returns a real. Questions? Yes? While I was doing this, I was just wondering how long is this supposed to take us? Because, um, should, just so that I know if this comes up on the test, like how much time should I allocate to this before I move on to the next problem? That's a very tricky answer. Question that I don't have a good answer for. Uh, would it take me shorter because I'm not narrating exactly what I'm doing? Yes. I'm also teaching the class, so you expect me to do it longer than it would take you. Uh, I, but you should be comfortable enough. Like the key here really is in this part, right? 
to me, that's the key. And part of why this is the key is knowing that, okay, here in this call, it must return a function, right? It can't return a real. So those are really the concepts that I'm teaching. I, I want you to learn. And so if you're comfortable doing this, right, you can just do these very mechanically and say, okay, this is reals here, reals here, functions here. Um, so I think it's more dependent on you and how much time you put into it, right? So I think you got to weigh that when you see all the questions and go, okay, where do I want to spend my time on, right? One of the things, I mean, talking game theory, right? You look at all these things and you say, that, okay, the type that f returns, and you look and you can tell very quickly that f must return a real. You can put real down for that one. No, no, you, we just want the final types here. But you have to be careful, right? Because if, um, you know, just eyeballing this and trying to figure it out, a lot more difficult. But hanging the types on all of the nodes in the tree, to me, helps a lot. Uh, there's another question over here. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, on two for a, uh, like, array operation, mm -hmm. if your index is a negative number, would that be a type error, or would it be like... What's the type of a negative number? What's the type of... So let's think about it like this. What's the type of, if you saw this, let's say it's a zero. What would the type of that be? An int. An int, right? What would the type of this be? That's also an int. Yeah, so what would the type of this be? An int. Right. But like, you can't access in an array, you can't access negative Where's one. The That's, yeah, that would be more of a semantic error. Okay. And actually, in some languages, you can. So like, okay. in Python, negative indexing means you start from the back. So negative one would be, I want the last element of the array. So yeah, it's kind of. You, could you make a type system to support this? Possibly. Uh, yeah, so, you could. So if it's if it's a negative number, then it doesn't it doesn't throw a type error. Exactly. Oh. Int. Yeah. Um, you know how you <coughs> drew the types for each of the nodes and all that. Mm -hmm. um, if we did that and got like one of the questions wrong on the midterm, would that be useful for partial credit to see what we've done? Possibly, but probably not. It all depends. Um, you know, we do our best, but sometimes, like, sometimes handwriting is bad. Sometimes it's not clear exactly where the problem is. Sometimes it's clear that <coughs> problems fall into certain categories, right? But, uh, you know, that's just the way it goes. Another thing, uh, this specifically said to reduce all types to basic types and type constructors if possible, right? So this would mean when you do the type of B, right, we know that B takes in a type of E. Uh, here as the second parameter. So if you put in as the second parameter here type of E, like T E, you're gonna get dot dot points, right? Because you're not reducing that fully down to what it is. Yeah. So there's there's no type errors in this because we're calling D with the parameter inside the if, but then yep. lower we're just using D as a parameter for C. Wouldn't D also need a here? Parameter? Yeah. Here and here? Yeah, here it's being called as a function, and here it's being passed into a function as a function. Right? Where did we get B, C, D, and E. From the function call. From the function call. From, they were parameters that are passed into this function. Right? Function. They're not, function B, C, D, and E, they don't exist. Okay. Right? There's not like a defined function C. Right? They're passed into our function. Just like how we can do that, we can do the same thing here by passing, by calling a function and then passing that function as a parameter to another function. Okay, so we're allowed to not have yeah, it's just a value, right? It's just about the types. So we know that based on the usage, D must be a, a type function, yeah. right? And it has certain parameters. And so we know because of that, when we call C, C must take in whatever the type of D is, and D just happens to be a function. Okay. Yeah, just like arrays, right? So it's no, nothing different than arrays. Like here, we have an array, E, right? We know it's an array based on the usage, and we can pass that array into another function. So arrays, functions, no different. Yeah. Um, is there a potential for having a, a type error on the test? It's a very tricky question. So this is actually a literal question from the final <coughs> last year. Uh, it. I would probably have a way for you to say that it was a type error, right? I would probably mention that in the description somewhere. Otherwise, we're going nuts trying to figure it out. Yeah, but if you're adamant that it's a type error, then write down type error. Like that's that's fine. But you you know, there's implicit clues in questions and how questions are asked, right? Yeah. So 
So when you first call the function and you pass those parameters in, we don't know that they're functions. What do you mean when you first? This, these parameters? Yeah, we don't know they're functions until, until we until actually we use the them. Check. Then exactly. we update them. Yes. So when you write the definition for f, you write it as a full definition yes, with the functions. Yes, you write the full definition. Like with if I asked for the type of f, you would do the entire the thing function. with t1, t2, t3, t4, all expanded to what they actually are. Okay. Are. And everything, if there's functions inside there, you define yes. those two. Okay. Yes. Yeah, fully extended. Okay, on to problem two. Back to other type systems, uh, structural types. So here we have our type declaration section, and here we have a bunch of variables, right? So we want to know, questions asking us for each of the following types, list the types that are structurally equivalent. So this is testing structural equivalence. And we'll get to this one in a second. So this is B is a string, C is a pointer to an int, D is a pointer to a B, E is a pointer to an I, down here. F is a structure, G is a structure, H is a structure, I is a structure, J is a structure, K is a structure. Okay, so it's specifically asking us about B. Oh, the types that are structurally equivalent. So B, F, what's structurally equivalent to B, what's structurally equivalent to F, what's structurally equivalent to H, and what's structurally equivalent to J. Okay, how can I do this in a little bit? Hard to do scratch paper here. Yeah. Uh, when I just have this thing. Start a new page. Let's think. Then I have to <gasps> flip back and forth. Okay. Let's do B, C, D, E. Oh. How many do you have here? It'd be nice if you had one page on that side. Use the whiteboard. But if I use the whiteboard, then it won't be recorded. They should be here. They should be here. Ooh. Harsh words, everybody online. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make this a little easier for ourselves. So I can make this huge table, right? And I can do the type equivalents of everything in that table. Right? But what do I already know? Can B ever be type equivalent or structurally equivalent to, let's say, C? Nope. nope. Why not? It's a pointer, and this is a basic type, right? Exactly. What about F? F through K? Right, so what's structurally equivalent to B? Nothing. Yeah, or B, right? You can probably put none too, right? So B is also structurally equivalent to B, right? So let's think about C, D, and E, right? They're all pointers. So I do want to find out what they're structurally equivalent to, right? Uh, I want to, because the problem is asking me to. Are they ever going to be structurally equivalent to any of F through K? No. 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 They're not going to be structurally equivalent. So I can build my table right, with only those elements, at least for right now. Right? I can do a C, D, E. I can do a table like that, C, D, and E. C, D, and E. Right? That's going to be just for my pointers. And I can actually build the same table for G, H, I, J, and K. Right? Because I know there's no possible way they could ever be structurally equivalent. And you, so you don't have to do it this way. You can totally do the big table. Just one pass through is going to get you these exact same results, right? Um, so what am I at? F. It's really taxing my alphabet knowledge. assume when I do structural equivalence? Structural equivalence is structurally equivalent. Hmm? Everything is structurally equivalent. Everything is structurally equivalent, yeah. I assume, yes, true, 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 true. true. So they keep saying true all these times for all these nodes. Let's say no. So we're going to assume it's blank, it's true. All right. So now we want to, so now we need to go through and figure out We'll start with the pointers, and then we can go through the other ones, right? So can C, is C structurally equivalent to C? Yes, yes it's always going to be structurally equivalent. Is C, and I'm going to actually erase these. I actually like the, oh god. Right. Okay, so 
C is structurally equivalent to C. Is C structurally equivalent to D? What would need to happen for them to be structurally equivalent? Int has to be structurally equivalent to B. Are int and B structurally equivalent? No. 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 So this is a big old no. What about D, C, and E? No. B would have to be structurally stru 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 equivalent to I. C and E. I. I. Int would have to be structurally equivalent to a structure, which no. can't be possible. Yeah. Right. Then we do, uh, so we did E, C. D and D are obviously structurally equivalent. D and E, uh, this would mean now that B and I have to be structurally equivalent. B is a string, I is a structure. Nope. So, nope, that's not there. And that would be this one here. So that's it. So if I look at what's, oh, so F, H, and J, these are the structures. Okay, so I did all the pointers, right? The pointers are only structurally equivalent to themselves. Now, I'd probably, if I was doing this, you know, I'd want to run through this one more time to make sure nothing changes. But I know everything is the only, you know, the, the equivalents, things are structurally equivalent to themselves, right? The diagonal is never going to change here. And everything else is false. So I've already proven that everything is not structurally equivalent. Okay, let's look at F. F is structurally equivalent to F. F is structurally equivalent to G. No, why not? Not in the same order, right? This is testing, making sure you remember the way we did structures, right? The order is the important thing. This is a string int, this is an int string. They are not structure equivalent. So F and G, not structure equivalent. F and H, is a string equivalent to a pointer to an I? No. No, can't possibly be. So not structure equivalent. F and I, Uh, so string and E will depend is, can string and E be structure equivalent? What? E is a pointer to I, so no, that no. can't be structure equivalent. <coughs> can F be structure equivalent to J? No. F string pointer, nope. No. G to K. F K, string pointer, nope. Then we do G, G, structure equivalent, G, H. No. Int pointer to int, nope. G, I. No. E, int, where E is a pointer to I. No. So no. K, uh, J. Uh, G, G, J. No. Int pointer, nope. Int pointer? No. No. All right. H H definitely structure equivalent. H I? Yes. I. Okay. Pointer to I and an E. Yes. E is a pointer to I. E is a pointer to I. <coughs> yeah. And I is structure equivalent to I. So that's structure equivalent. Then we have to look at the next field, e. right? We can't just look at one field. It has to be every single field. Is D structure equivalent to a pointer to a string? Yes. 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 So D. D is a pointer to a B, so it's a pointer, that's good, so the pointers have to point to the same thing, this is a string, this is a B, D is a structure equivalent to a string. And the order that's, is the same. And the order is the same, exactly. Okay, H, I, I is good. H, J, so H is a pointer to an I, J is a pointer to a K, I and K, are they structure equivalent? No. no. Well, we don't yet. Yes, right? On the table, Early, yes. they are structure equivalent, right? I and K. All right, then we look at D. We say, is D structure equivalent to case a function that takes in KC and returns Boolean? No. No, right? It's a pointer to a B. So this is not structure equivalent, H and J. Okay, H and K. We have H, we have K, pointer to I, pointer to J. Is I structure equivalent to J? Yes. Table says yes. Okay, that's good. But is D structurally equivalent to J pointer to int? No, D is a pointer to a B, so that can't possibly be. So HK, not. Okay, I. 
I is structurally equivalent to I. IJ is E structurally equivalent to a pointer to K. For now. So E is a pointer to I. So I and K, are they structurally equivalent? I for now, we don't for know. now we think they are. Yes, for now they are. Okay. Okay, we're talking IJ. Okay, but then we look at the second parameter for the second field, right? We see pointer to a string, and we see a function. Nope. Functions and pointers can't be the same type, nope. right? So this is definitely not. Okay, IK. Here, X is an E, and... So we say, is E the same as a pointer to a J? E is a pointer to an I, so are I and J structurally equivalent? I and J, no, they're not structurally equivalent, right? We've already decided that. This means I, K cannot be structurally equivalent. Right, and it also helps if we look at the second parameter here. The second field, sorry. Uh, okay, so I, K. All right, so J, K. J is a pointer to a K, K is a pointer to a J. Are J and K structurally equivalent? We don't know yet. Yes. 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 According to the table, yes. Right. That's why we fill in the table first. And we first have a check mark. Then we say, okay, the second field. They are they both functions? Yes. Yes. So for them to be structurally equivalent, every parameter must be structurally equivalent, and the return value must be structurally equivalent. So we can easily see return value check. So we see, is K structurally equivalent to J? Yes. So, yes. Far, yes. so far, yes. Is C structurally equivalent to a pointer to an int? Yes. 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 So they're structurally equivalent. Cool. Look at that. Yes. I mean, if we were looking at J compared to K, why did we know already that the pointer to K and the pointer to J were the same? When we looked at which one? Say it again. So we're already we're looking at the J Yes. So why did we say that we knew that the pointer to K and the pointer to J were the same? Because so that is how we do structural equivalence algorithm. I mean, we assume, we assume from the start, so there's two ways to do it, right? We assume from the start that they're all structurally equivalent, okay. and then we prove structural non-equivalence. Okay. Right? The other way to do it is you start as they're all non-equivalent, and then you go through and prove that they're equivalent. But the problem there is you get the loops. So here we break those loops by saying, OK, we assume that they're structurally equivalent until we have evidence to prove otherwise. So yes? So based kind of on the test, do you just like mark uh, the ones that you assumed were like structurally equivalent because of the table being true from the start? Like, would you mark those just so like you don't have to go through all of the structures again? Do you know what I mean? Say that again? So like J and K, so you, mm -hmm. you assumed that J and K were equal. That's how you figured out they were equivalent, right? Mm -hmm. Did you like put a mark, like let's say it was actually G and H that you set for? Did you put a mark next to them just so you know so that you can go through again and check? I would, so on a table like this, what I would do is I would go through one more time checking all of the non-empty tables, right? So I've already proved. If I've proved that they're not structurally equivalent, then I don't have to do any more work. So you just recheck the true ones. Exactly. Recheck the true ones, and I don't need to recheck the diagonals. Okay. They're always going to be true. So here I'd check H, I, just to make sure nothing changed. And I'd say, yes, H and I are structurally equivalent. And I'd also check J, K again one more time. Right, so now I can answer the question. So I can say, OK, what's structurally equivalent to F? The only thing structurally equivalent to F is F. Uh, H, what's structurally equivalent to H? H and I. What's structurally equivalent to J? Uh, J and K. J, J, K, guys. Okay. So now we've got that all, all out of the way. Now we have another question here. Yes? I'm sorry, someone already asked, but do we have to write both itself and the other thing? Or is it just the other thing? Else? Yes, write, the, write itself, right? It is structurally equivalent to itself. Okay. Variable. So here we have w and x are strings, y and z are v and d, p and q are array of j's, r is array of j's, s is a function that takes an j, returns an int, t is a j. 
So for each of the following assignment statements, indicate if the statement is valid under name equivalence, structural equivalence, or internal name equivalence. So we're going to write uh, one for name equivalence, two structural equivalence, three internal name equivalents, or four otherwise, right? So this would be, this is telling you how to write that there is a type error, right? Contrast that with the first problem. Okay, write all that apply. So can I do Q is equal to R? Yes. Array of J under name equivalents? No. Can I do it under structural equivalents? Yes, they're structure equivalent. Are they internal name equivalent? Yeah. No. Okay. PQ, are PQ eternal uh, name equivalent? No. No, it has no. no name, right? Anon this is an anonymous type. This type has no name, right? This type B has a name. The type name is B, right? And like here, the type name is D, even though D is a pointer to a B, right? It still has a name. The name is D. Okay, PQ. Uh, so is it structurally equivalent? Yes. 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 Are they internal name equivalent? Yes. Yes. X equals Y. So X equals Y. String and B, are they name equivalent? No, they do not have this name, name right? One is a string and the other's name is B, right? Are they structurally equivalent? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do they have internal name equivalents? No, right? No. They, Right? Because here's a string and here's a B. They have different names, right? Okay. Z equals Q bracket zero. Right? So what is Q bracket zero going to, what type is going to be returned? J. J. So this is asking, is J equivalent to the type of Z, which is a pointer to B. Which is a D. So J is a structure, D is a pointer. Right, so is it name equivalent? No, no, no. It has to be. Right, it's a type error. Okay, this one. Q's, so we said array access of Q returns J. J. And then we have S, so S takes in a J and returns what? An int. An int. And then we use an int inside of an array access for P, which returns a J. A J. So ultimately this returns a J. No. Oh, that looks like. J. Okay, and then T is what? J. A J. So are they name equivalent? Yes. yes. Yes, they have the same name, right? Both are type J. Yes, name equivalent. Are they uh, structurally equivalent? Yes. Are they eternal name equivalent? Yes. Yes. Okay. WX. So W equals X, are they name equivalent? W and X? Yes. yes. They're both strings, right? Yes. Definitely the same name, and they're the same structure, and they have the same internal name. Questions? <coughs> yes? Why is string name equivalent? What's the name of it? But that, isn't that a primitive type? Uh, it's a primitive type, right? But it's not a new type, right? So these pointers and structures, these are and these arrays are creating new types. Right? So here we have a string. A string is a string. Is a string, right? That's the name, that's its type. It's, it's built in. You don't have to yeah. worry. It's already predefined for you. Yeah? So is that why P and Q aren't then uh, name equivalent? Because you don't know if they're the same thing as array? <coughs> it's more about the fact that we, we don't have a name for it, so they're not name equivalent. Because it's like a new anonymous type. Yeah, it's just about the names. Yeah, I, because here, I mean, I guess it does depend on how you're doing size or something. Maybe you could think of it that way. But it'd be the same thing, like defining here the function. The type of this function has no name, right? We don't know what the type of this function, what the name of this function is, right? It's not like we're saying every function that has this type is a type foo or something, like we declared it over here. We, we know its type uh, is an int. We just don't know its function. Name. name. We don't know the name. The yeah. name. So the only way you'd have something nameable with S is if you had like S comma Y and then takes it, you know, the definition of what it does. That's the only way you get name equivalence there. For where? Here? For S. For 
S? Yes, okay. you would have to define, like, a, so here we've declared types, right? Now when we use D, every time we declare a variable that is name D, right, those are going to be name equivalent because it's literally the same name because we have defined the name as D. Here we have not defined any name for these functions, so, so they can't name equivalent. Well. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so for x equals y, x is a string and y is a D, and D is a string. Yes. So that's not internal name equivalence? No. Internal name equivalence is about where it's declared here. So this internal name equivalence means that internally it's going to give the same name. Wait. Name equivalent. Let's see, x, y. They're both pointing to strings. Wait, no, no, they have different names, so they don't have the same internal name. Okay, yeah, that's the way to think about it, right? They don't have the same name, and they're not declared. So here, p and q, right? We don't know what the name of their type is, but we know they both are whatever this thing is. So internally, those are going to be the same. p and q are going to be the same. It's about what variables are declared together on the same line. So essentially, they'd be both. They, they, they would both be pointing at the same uh, circle, box circle diagram. Uh, it's more about types, though. Types. It's more like when you built your type system, right, and you gave, you said all of these things are this type, right? You have that constraint. This is saying P and Q are both this type. Whatever it is, we don't know the name, but internally we know they have to be the same because they're declared on the same line. Here you'd have to do, essentially you can think about it, you have to do more work to see that this array of J, that R is the same type as P. You have to do more work to look at the types and see if they're the same. They don't have a name. Yeah? How is T equal to like P and all of that name equivalent, but P equals Q is not name equivalent? <laughs> because P and Q, what's the name of the type of P and Q? Right. Well, how does P have a name down when T equals P and all of that? How does that have a name? But the type that's returned is J, right? J is the name. Why is Between this, P and P0. <coughs> What's the type of this? An R and array of J. Yes, exactly. And what's the type of this here? Like after applying the array access operator, right? What's the type here that this returns? The whole thing, though. What is this return? An array of J. After accessing it? After accessing We don't know. What do you mean we don't know? So. That's an int in if I take P, bracket. right? P is an array of J's, right? Exactly, perfect. Then if I index it into that array, what is an element of an array of J's? Right, like if I said, um, whatever J is. if I said A is equal to this, right? Let's say you're doing Hindley Milner, right? What would be the type of A here? J. So the array index, right, you got to think, so we have an array of J's, right, the index operator is going to pull one of those J's out and return it. Okay. So the type of whatever it turns is the kind of like, it's just like pointers, right? So when you dereference a pointer, yeah. you get to the, the type of that dereference is whatever that thing points to. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No, no, it's a good question. Uh, it's very, it's kind of not intuitive. the name of this type here? Anonymous. Anonymous. Uh, so it has no name. Okay. Right? What's the name of this type here? String. That's a string. It's a type that is built in. It's, it's already named, right? String. But any two strings are going to have name equivalents, right? Just like any two integers are name equivalent because the type of those is int. But if I define a new type like centimeters, which is an int, 
I can't. I don't want to be able to uh, equate centimeters to ints because it's not the same thing. Right? They're not. They don't have the internal same name, even though they may have the same size storage. Right? I mean, they may be ints underneath, but the programmer has declared a new type that says these have to be ints, or these have to be. These are different names. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. <coughs> All right, consider the following code in C syntax. Draw the program stack at the first execution. Yes? So, string is considered a name when looking at the stack? Yes. Oh, it is. What else would it be? I mean, so the basic type, right? I mean, I guess, well, I guess I do agree we never uh, defined it specifically, right? But like string, int, boolean, right? Those are the built in. Those are the names of the built-in types, right? Right. So, but like a pointer to an int is now a new type that never existed before, and an array of ints is now a new type that never existed before. So saying before. x is an int and y is an int on different lines, so they're still there. Yes, because the same int is the name, right? They are just have the same name. All right. So draw the program stack in the first execution of location one. Label on the stack all function frames, and inside each function frame, label the parameters to the function, the values of those parameters, the function's local variables, and the value of those local variables. Okay. Also important point here, you do not need to follow precise C decal calling convention. So we're not going to be creating, or we don't care about the order of the local variables specifically. We just want to make sure that you know how to draw and understand the stack. Also important point, right? Assume static scoping and pass by value semantics. Right? So this tells you exactly how to interpret the C program. Okay. So we have main. So we know here we're gonna have our function frame for main. And it's gonna be passed, it has some x. What's the value of x? We don't know yet, right? When main gets called, there is no value for x. Uh, it has a local variable pop and a character array of A's. So I'm going to kind of represent it like this. Uh, you could also spread it out and do A0, A1, A2 with the value specifically of each, and that would be totally fine. Okay, let me sec check. Oh, and here we have a global i is 10, right? Do I draw that on my stack? No, right? i is not on the stack. The stack is just the function frame. But I need to keep track of this i so I know what happens, right? Okay. So if i is 10, i is i 10 when main is first executed? Yes. We set x equal to 20. We set i equal to 0. We then print out the values of x and i. Do I ask you to print what it is? I guess not. Well, that's probably debugging stuff for me. Um, OK, so print out the values. We know exactly what they would print out. It's actually very easy. They said it right here. So if x is greater than 0, so is x greater than 0? Yes. Yes, yes we're going to call function foo. Right? So we're going to have a new frame on our stack. We're going to call this frame foo, and actually we're not going to, oh, I'm going to do kind of an open-ended one so we can add more, right? So we're passing in, right? Foo has the parameters B, the parameter C, and the parameter A, right? Now we have to look at, so when we invoke this function, what are the values that we're passing in here? So for B, we pass in A2, which is 0, 1, 2, is 2. A0, 0, and X, which is 20. Right? <coughs> so that's just the parameters to foo, right? Then the local variables of foo, foo has two local variables, I and T. Right? So we say I is equal to A plus 1. A is 20, so I is 21. Now we're calling what? Main. Main. Can we do that? Function. No. No? Yeah, you can. It's a function. Yeah, you can, yeah. It's a function. 
Yes. yes. There's nothing special about main. It's just a function, just like every other function. Okay, but do we? So, what's the next function frame that's going to be on here? Is it going to be main? Right. We first are calling bar and passing the result of bar into main. Right. So then we have to call bar. And bar has a beta and an alpha. I think this is from the last exam. From the last final. Last final. Which is two and a half hours, right? Or two fifty. <laughs> so we won't have questions this long. We won't. <laughs> that that gesture is not inspired. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of the power of midterm comes from practicing and preparing for it rather than actually taking it. Okay, so we call bar, we pass in A and C. A is 20, C is 0. And it has local variable B, B is 10. I think bar is going to go away, but that's fine. We have to still have to see what it returns. We have i is equal to i minus 20. So i is the global i, which was 0. Now it's minus 20. Right? And then we return what? Main of i. Main of i. That's good. Oh, this is good. We're almost done. OK. It's convoluted. Ain't different than any programs you guys write? I've seen some of those programs. I'm just kidding, they're all pretty, I love them. <laughs> all right, return main of i, so we pass in i for x now in main. So now we have a new function frame main. We have x as the parameter, which is passing in the global i as an x, which is negative 20. And then main has a local variable pop. And then the local character array. We have our array. And it is 0, 1, okay, 2. Is i equal to 10? No. Is x greater than 0? No. x is negative 20? No. Else what? Location one, so now we're done. Now we have main, which called foo, which called bar, which called main. Yeah. So these have to be in order on the test? Yes. The order, right? I mean, this is the order that these functions are called, right? That's what this stack represents. That's actually one of the key ideas of function frames that I want you to understand. Don't. Put it on scratch paper. <laughs> we can write it like that, right? We don't have to do like. It doesn't have to be continuous. Okay. Like we did in class. These don't have to be continuous. They do. You have to have every frame with a label, right? You have to have all the parameters, all the local variables, and their values that you know. Right? Can you scroll down for a Other questions? Yes. Yeah. Are you liable to ask us something like assume dynamic scoping? Why not? Okay. <laughs> it's fun, guys. It's fun. These are all fun stuff. Okay. okay, so I'll let you guys decide. I'll just keep going. If you got to leave, leave. Uh, I'll just keep recording. Do you want problem four first or problem five first? Yeah, I'll just keep recording and I'll keep going through all of them. So you don't have to be exactly here if you want to. Yeah, okay, we'll do five, I agree. We'll go back and do four. Okay. Um, yay. Okay, problem five. Fully parenthesize the following lambda expressions. Another way this could be phrased is fully disambiguate these expressions, right? So is starting like in this inner one, is UP, is this ambiguous? Just this right here? Oh, uh, wait. No. No, right? 
But WXUP, right, is ambiguous. And so we know this is going to be left associative, right? So we're going to add parentheses around WX and then parentheses around WX. Probably have to change this to say rewrite this. This gets crazy. OK. Uh, here, right? No, because that would change the meaning, right? So I've also added, right, I know that this period means that everything inside here, right, to as far right as possible is inside the, the body of the lambda y abstraction. Right? So then I also know that this body extends all the way here. And then what do I know about the wy? W and X and this, right? Yeah, we need another parentheses around that. So it would be uh, lambda X dot X Y lambda Y dot W X U P. Make another one. Uh, that's uh, yeah, can we rewrite that? Not clear at all. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, what was what I do? Not seeing. Yeah, you could do it yourself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the point of doing a practice midterm. We have parentheses around the whole body of x. We have parentheses around x, y, because x, y applied to this is ambiguous. right? So we need to know that x, y happens first. And the result of that is applied with this. You missed the parentheses no, after the, at the end. There should be four. There should be four, yeah. <laughs> How long y'all want to be here? All day. All day. All day. I like that. All day for the grade. Well, this is more valuable than our class. Absolutely. These are for you. Don't tell. Don't tell your other professor. Oh, he. Is within the body of Z. Oh, wait, you're missing, you're missing a part again. What? You're missing a parenthesis. Yeah, you are missing a parenthesis. There you go. Oh, another thing that I can do that you can't do is zoom in. Yes. Okay, so I know I'm going to have to have parentheses around this whole thing, right? Because this is the entire body of Z. I will. Then, so this is, so if we go next, this applied to this, is there any ambiguity here with the existing parentheses? No. No, right? It's two things being applied to each other, so that's all that it can be. Right? Adding parentheses won't clarify anything here. Inside the lambda y abstraction, right, we have, where does this end? Here or here? At the first parentheses. At the very, at yeah, the very, very, at the very right. Yeah, there you go. Here? Or here? <coughs> no. No. <coughs> it's in parentheses. Right? It's right. Exactly, yes. It's in parentheses, right? So you think about parsing this thing, uh, right? You think about parsing this thing, there's no possible way that this period can't extend past this because this parentheses means that this is going to be one unit, right? When we parse this, everything in this parentheses, we can't extend and try to parse other things, right? It's going to change the meaning. Is Z, Y, Z ambiguous? Yes. Yeah, so we need to throw the parentheses around there. We go over here, lambda X, so we can add parentheses from here to the end of the body there. And yeah, you could maybe throw some parentheses around X, but I don't think it's necessary. Yeah. Out of curiosity, do you need those parentheses? Yeah. Which ones? The last one you just added. Uh, yeah, I guess technically no, because it should be unambiguous, because it's just one expression following it. Um, I would be fine. I mean, you don't have to go super crazy, but it needs to be semantically the same, right? So what you're looking for is, A, is it the same meaning as what it was before? And B, 
did you, is it in any way ambiguous? But I think before you're right, it would be not, it, there'd be a, no ambiguity without having these, but to me it makes it a little bit cleaner. Okay. So again, A, B, C, lambda X dot X, A, B. This one was beautiful. So here I need parentheses around A and B. I need more parentheses around right left associative. And then, so now I don't need any more parentheses. Well, but I need to understand exactly what this expression does. So yeah, I would throw parentheses around this just to make it very clear. Then I would add parentheses around the body here, and then more parentheses around XA. It's actually a lot easier. Questions? Yeah, so like a parse tree? Yeah. Yeah, that would be really good. That's actually a great way to practice, too. So that way, I mean, yeah. I can just look at this and kind of know where things would go, right? But it's all about knowing why these things are like this and why they're parsed like that. So yeah, you have the grammar for it. So parsing it is really good. OK, circle all free variables in each of the following expressions. I wonder if I can get the people at home sick. <laughs> <laughs> circle all free variables in each of the following expressions. All right, so here I have lambda w dot twi. So inside the body of lambda w, what is not free? What is bound? W. w. So this means what about t and i? They're free. They're free. <laughs> now w. All right, now w is right free. is outside the body, so it is now free. Okay. Lambda i. So inside the body, i will be bound. And remember, because of the disambiguation rules, we know the body is this entire thing. Right? I don't have to parenthesize it. If I was going to, I'd do something like this. Right? So inside here, i is now bound. Inside here, w is now bound. So which of these three is a free variable? T. T. All right, similar logic. Inside here, w is bound. So both t and i are free variables. Inside here, i is bound. And then inside here, w is bound. So t and w. Which means t is free. But outside here, w is no longer bound, so it is now free. It's actually a really pretty letter when we zoom in. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, it's cool. I wish I could write this too. Okay. So here we have, here it may help to put the parentheses in. Here, I is bound, T is bound, I is bound again. Right? So I is bound. It's bound to this I, right? We didn't really talk about it, but it's bound to this abstraction, not the outer abstraction. Now, here we have another function where we bind W. And so now we have I, T, W. All bound. All bound. Right, so we call this a combinator because there's no free variables. Okay. Problem five or four? Yep. yep. Yes. How are we doing on time? How are we got playing time? Okay. <laughs> Consider the following code in C syntax. Parentheses. Use static scoping. Include standardio.h, so let's skip uh, the actual code. And let's look at the question. So if parameters are passed by value, the output of this program is. If parameters are passed by reference, the output of the program is. Then we go to the next one, and this is prob problem four continued. Uh, is this useful, do you think? Repeating. Yes. So much. Okay. <laughs> right, noted. If parameters are passed by name, the output of this program is this. Yes. Okay. Let's see, common mistakes that I saw before we start on this problem. So here, this printf, what is this going to output? The, uh, whatever what is it actually going to output? Uh, number dash a number. 
and then a line break. Yes. Right? The dash. I mean, I honestly don't care if it's a dash or a space. I mean, you should have a dash because of the dash, right? Um, but it's actually, like, if I just did new lines, it would be a little bit ridiculous, the output, right? It'd be like 30 things output. So that's why I added dashes, because uh, spaces are actually hard to visually see, right? So you may not know that that's actually a space. This does not mean that we're subtracting B from star C. <laughs> All right, important to understand. I didn't, I didn't think that that would be a problem. It was. Okay, so why don't we go through this um, normally, right, in our normal pass by value. This, this question should be the gimme. Oh, I put the points here, it's fine. Um, right, this should be, just go through this, execute this, like well, how would this C program execute, right? Okay, we don't have any global variables, which is nice. Uh, we have main, so main has an int i, so I'm actually going to draw the stack just, I mean, a little bit, just because it helps, right? i is 10, t, sorry, uh, t is going to be, alpha. Uh, right, it's going to contain, let's say, alpha, which is some memory location, maybe box circle is better. have i, which is 10, we have t, which now has the value alpha, and then we say star t is equal to 20, so I'm copying the value 20 into where t points to, 20, and then, then I'm calling bar i t, right, so then I call bar, and bar has parameter b, so what's inside b? The value 10, exactly. And then C is contains alpha. Contains alpha, yes, exactly. Right? But the important thing here is that they are new <coughs> boxes and circles, right? Yep. Okay, and then A also has an array. So A I mean, technically, A would be a pointer. Uh, wait. I think we can consider it like this for right now, and this would be fine. Actually, where's A used? Okay, yeah, we just changed the value. Okay, great. Okay, A is that. Then we have an X, right, in bar, where X is 0. Then we set B equal to X. What does that do out here? Nothing. 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 Exactly. B equals x, so 0. We C, we do malloc size of int. So C, we malloc a new beta. And we copy that value into here. And I said star C equal to 42, so I'm going to change beta to now be 42. Then I'm going to pass into foo x and a a bracket x into foo, which is just value, right? Which is just the value. So here in foo, I'm gonna have b, which is zero, zero, and I'm going to have c, which is which is okay. So a x, so a is this array. X is zero, so it's gonna be zero as well. Uh, then I have a local variable x that says x is <coughs> b plus c, which is 0. Right? And b is equal to b plus 1. Return x plus c. 0. 1. No, wait, no. X plus c, 0. Well, I come back to foo, and I put 0 into a2. Then now I print out, okay, what's B is 0, star C is 40, 42, right? 0, 42, which would be 0 dash 42. Then I'm going to print out all the A's with dashes, right? So 0, 1, 0. Then 
Then bar returns, we come back to main, we print out the value of i and the value of star t. I is what? 10. And star t is 20. Good. Okay. Now, if the parameters are passed by reference, now it's the output of star. Oh, I got this in 10 minutes. Okay. The parameters are passed by reference. The output of this program is. We have main, we set i equal to 10, we malloc a new t, we set star t equal to 20, right? So same all here. Then we call bar of i t, right? But now when we call that, now how does b and c in our diagram here change? Uh, b points to i's location and c points to t's location. Yes, right? The key is just the bindings here, right? So b is now bound here, c is now bound here, right? That's what changes. We still have the local A, which is 0, 1, 2. Then we have X is 0. Now when we do C is equal to malloc size of int, now we create our B, our beta. And we copy beta here. Right? Then we set star, star C to be 42. We are now changing here beta. Right? What happened to alpha? Now garbage, right? We can't actually access it. Yes. Um, okay, we did that. Then we set foo x a x. So now we pass into foo, right? Now we have. Okay. So now we have x, c, and b, right? So x is the local variable. Let's not worry about that now. We have b and c. So what is b bound to? B is now, this B is now bound to X. And then what is C bound to? A2. A2, yeah. So it's going to be bound to this guy, right? Yes. I think we slipped B equals X in the last function. Oh, good call. Okay. Uh, yes, we did. Okay, B equals X. We'll copy 10 into X. This, this B. Uh, oh, yeah. No, no, this is B, right, which is 10. We copy that into X, the local X, which is now. Isn't X. C bound to A0? Yeah. Yeah. X equals 0. X equals 0. B equals X. Sorry, we say X equals 0. This sets this to 0. Right. And you said B to X. <laughs> Someone has not had their morning cup. No, it's only one cup. So sad. Is there somebody there? So we put zero into this B. Good, good catch. Then we are, OK, so let me call this function. OK. We bind the local B in foo to the same box as X. And we bind C to? Wouldn't it be A0? A0, yes. Okay, then we set x is equal to b plus c. B, plus, b is 0, c is 0, which means x is now 0. Or, sorry, this is actually the local x, right? We have to make a new copy. It's more like a box. Oklahoma. It's good enough. <laughs> is that a state with the thing? Yeah. All right, b is equal to b plus 1. We said b is. Uh, B is 0, so we set B equal to B plus 1. Uh, we're going to return X plus C. Return X is 0, C is 0, so we return 0. Uh, so we set A2. That's where I got the A2 from. Got it. Okay, A2, we're going to set that to be 0. And now we print out B star C. We print out what? 0, 0 42. And then when we print out 0, 1, 0, 0, 42. Now when we return, right, now we return here. Yeah, and now we print out i and star t. Right, well, what's i? 0. And star t is 
42. Right, so why didn't this upper one change? I mean, why didn't the upper first two levels change, or first two outputs change? It's a local array within the Yeah, we look here, right? B is the only thing that's, well, assigned to here, right, in foo, which means that x is the only thing that could change, but we don't output x here. Okay. Are we good on that? Yep. All right. I got. We'll do pass by name and three. You want the answer and then. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if I can just do that. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Let's see. So I is ten here. It's ten. T is. It's gonna be the same. The first one zero forty two should be the same. Well, okay. Let's let's step through this. <laughs> All right, I is 10, uh, T is mallocking a new thing. We're setting star of T to be 20. We call a bar, so we're passing in. So every time we see bar and C, we're going to use I and T. But these aren't expressions, right? So this isn't going to, it'll be fundamentally the same as passed by reference in terms of B and C. Uh, the difference comes in, we have X, we set B equal to X, so X, B is now zero. So B, this sets this I to be zero. The C mallocks a new size of int. C is the same thing as T. So this sets this T to be basically beta. Right? And we set star C to be 42, which sets is actually star T equals 42. So now star T is equal to 42. Now we say bar I, oh sorry, we already did part of So now we're here, we say A2 is equal to foo XAX. Right? So we have A2. We're passing in x right now is 0, right? But we don't pass these values in, right? We're going to make a new copy of foo, which is the same, except we're doing int x equals, x. Uh, let's call it x bar, right? So it's bars x, and then a of x bar, right? Mm -hmm. So we do this, and then we say b x bar is equal to x bar plus 1. And then we return uh, x plus a bracket x bar. Right? So this is going to be x bar is 0. So it's going to be 0 plus, why is this not a plus? 0 plus a x bar. Which is 0. So it would still be zero. So in so zero. So this x is zero, right? We have x bar is equal to x bar plus one. So x is now one, right? And then we return x, which is zero, plus a bracket bar. A bar is now what? One. 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 So a one is one. One. one so it's going to return one. So it's going to set a two to be one. One. And so when it outputs b. Right, let's still output zero. Mm -hmm. Star C is going to be 42. Then it's going to output zero, 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 one, two, zero. Zero, one, one. Zero, zero, one, one. Zero, one, one. Zero, one, one. Right, X is zero here. Zero plus one is one. Wait. Yes, okay. And then this will return. Then we print out the values of I and star T. I is 0, star T is 42. So the big change is in the second line, right? But it is actually a pretty significant change that knows that shows that you know exactly how call by name 